So I will uh, continue from where uh, Roland, Gerard and Alex stop because this is um, again about iterative architecture and then uh, detailed information about agile processes. So uh, Yep. So uh, before looking at the solution, like, let's uh, look at what are the problems that uh, we are facing when we are uh, working on these projects. The first uh, uh, problem, uh, this is uh, one of our experience that we had some time back. We worked on a digital platform, um, a platform basically with 100 APIs, uh, 60 message flows, and around 80 services and n number of databases. Uh, so this was architected to use multi-tenancy. And then uh, there were three active tenants uh, when it went into production. Uh, but the problem is uh, basically it went into production after three years uh, from the design uh, to implementation. When it um, uh, went into production, uh, there was uh, the requirements has changed and then the value that platform uh, would have provided was not there. So that's the first problem. And uh, the, the, the reason for the problem is what you see in the background. It's basically they followed a, a waterfall um, uh, type of a method uh, to implement the project and plan the project. The problem number two. Uh, some reason it's not working. TK is not working. Okay. Nope. Okay. Uh, yeah, TK is not working. Can you switch that to you? Okay. Yeah, so the second problem is this, um, that we found RFPs, basically it's killing the innovation. Uh, so the problem with the RFP, the same scenario. So if you uh, look at the Nope, doesn't work. Sorry about that. So the, uh, so, so next problem is RFP, then the same problem. Uh, like if you look at the timeline of RFP, you spend a lot of time to gather requirements and then spend a lot of time to document the requirement to create the RFP. And then uh, uh, look at the vendors, evaluate the vendors, go through the vendor process, and then uh, start the implementation. Probably when you start the implementation, the requirements are not valid anymore. And then you go through the implementation phase and deliver it. So uh, that's another problem uh, that we see. So sometimes you can't avoid the RFP. So advice is like if you uh, try as much as possible to avoid the RFPs. If you can't avoid it, then design the RFP in a way uh, that uh, I'm going to explain in this uh, uh, during this presentation. The results are like this, right? If you uh, have a boat in a desert, what's the purpose? Like a homeless person can use the boat to uh, have shelter, but uh, it doesn't provide the real value. So that's what happened when you follow these type of processes. So the answer for that, um, uh, this is a real world example. Uh, I'm not sure who's familiar with this. Uh, so this is the uh, Hubble uh, telescope. So if you look at uh, the current version and then how it started, it started in a timeline like this. So this is a kind of a great engineering architecture and implementation because whatever they designed in 1990s or earlier than that, I think 70s, uh, so basically it fit into the current uh, architecture that they have implemented today. They managed to uh, incrementally improve this uh, architecture fitting uh, to the uh, stuff that they did earlier. So that's kind of a really good example of this iterative approach and then a successful story. So it's uh, the fundamentally the idea is uh, think big, act small. I think you can see the cat and the lion. So that's the uh, the fundamental idea of uh, this uh, iterative um, uh, approach. Uh, so the the, um, uh, the how you start 
uh, based on this minimum viable product that you identify what's the minimum product that you can build, quickly go to market and then start providing um, uh, value for your consumers. So the, uh, the basically you plan, you build, you test and you repeat. So the, um, uh, you can quickly get the, face, uh, the feedback from the uh, uh, consumers because you are delivering something. And next thing I want to highlight in this picture, you plan, build, test, run based on what you have. So, uh, and build a product based on the environment that uh, you can build this uh, product basically. So the uh, iterative approach, uh, we know the technical approach, even uh, Gerard Roland explained this thing uh, earlier about uh, how technically you can build this thing, but there's a non-technical part of this story as well. So I'll start with the non-technical part because that's the most challenging uh, thing in iterative architecture. So I call it as iterative peopleware. So basically to de uh, deliver digital products, you need to have a digital workforce, like uh, everybody should be aligned with the strategy, everybody should understand the strategy, everybody should um, uh, understand the technology and so forth, so it has to be a digital workforce. But you can't have a digital workforce from day one. So um, uh, we uh, usually call this as a, uh, the small team as a pod, uh, so it contains around maximum 10, 15 people usually. Uh, so uh, to select a small uh, pod and then uh, convert them uh, who can work on the uh, problems. Yeah, so basically the idea here uh, to identify a small team, uh, we call them as a pod or a scrum team, and then start developing these capabilities um, uh, uh, by educating them. Can you click at least uh, till we get No. Okay, so uh, to operate the pods, you, to, you have to have a, a podular organization. The organization should structure in a way uh, for these pods to operate. So we call it as a podular organization. Uh, so I took this image from this book called The Connected Company. So it explained detail about how you can uh, operate and create pods, so and so forth. If you get a chance, it's a, a great book to read. Uh, so the, uh, the first or the, um, uh, the primary group we called as a digital co. So how you uh, build the digital co, basically there will be a knowledge and a cultural gap. So how you uh, bridge that gap and build a small team uh, called the digital co. After you build a successful digital co, then you will start uh, bringing rest of the staff, basically increasing your uh, digital workforce uh, incrementally. So to do that, you can, uh, the digital co can evangelize about the new technologies. And then um, uh, you can have a proper onboarding program for the other uh, to come and operate in this environment. And then you can have a proper structured training programs, as well as uh, uh, things like hackathons are really effective. And I think uh, uh, we did one hackathon at uh, TFL as well. Uh, so those kind of uh, techniques can be used to increase your uh, digital workforce. Then uh, you should have a open system to um, adopt this uh, different type of um, uh, new cultural changes. So the organizations can, um, organizations can tell we have open system but uh, in their strategy, in their vision, but uh, most of the organization they don't practice open system. So uh, in the WSO2 is a really uh, uh, design in a way as an open system that we have open culture. Uh, Sanjay a little bit explain about that thing at uh, the, his talk. And then we have the open architecture. So the everything work as an open system. So I will tell one story. I told a lot of stories, another story about uh, how WSO2 is a pure open system. So in 2009, February, I came back uh, uh, from Boston after doing a customer engagement, and my workstation has changed. So then uh, it has changed to a product team, uh, and then I'm, uh, I was kind of uh, thinking why the, my workstation has changed. Then I went to uh, uh, walk to Sanjeeva, like uh, those days we 
were implementing open uh, office open office environment but uh, those days we had offices so he was listening to uh, 90s music loudly and then uh, I went to him he knew why I came because uh, we kind of had a good understanding about each other but he didn't ask why I came and he asked about the Boston trip and we have a common interest about basketball we talk about Celtics all this stuff and then uh, I started the topic so why I uh, started because the environment was there to ask this question then I asked why uh, the workstation has changed then he explained me okay the one of the products the product lead went for grad school and then we need some kind of a strong leadership um, so we think you can do that in a typical organization, the second question I will not even ask or tell uh, because uh, yeah, I know the result. But then again, I had the environment to tell this is not what I want to do. Um, I would like to work on all the products and then I would like to closely work with customers. So that's what I want to do. Then uh, I didn't get the typical answer that I usually get from another organization and Sanjeeva gave me a book. Uh, it was a book about uh, SOA patterns and then he said, okay, learn this stuff and then go and have fun that is his usual uh, feedback and as a result so I'm here and then we have a global architecture team uh, helping customers so that's the result of a truly open system that's basically uh, doing a couple of things it's basically uh, engage people with these projects and then empower people and uh, finally entrust people so that's the uh, truly open system that will support uh, the organization and then build uh, various stuff I think as uh, WSO2 we have done like a lot of uh, really cool work so the latest cool thing is ballerina you will heard about it. you will hear about uh, it uh, uh, during the next session so why we manage to deliver these stuff quickly and then in a way because uh, we operate as an open system so that is one success that we uh, found with other organizations who building these uh, uh, di digital products the next part is the iterative software I think there was a question about the whether we can, you, how you can do iterative uh, uh, how you can have agile architecture so I will answer in detail uh, in this section so basically there are two models uh, that uh, we find uh, in uh, this approach the first one basically uh, uh, you can have the basic layers of the architecture like in this example I took the system of record most of the organization already exists and this uh, so system of record again already exists so you build a system of, of engagement by directly accessing the data and then you can introduce the system of integration layer and finally you can uh, do the system of automation this is one approach to this, pre uh, this, this problem by introducing each and every layer one by one so if we go back to our onion diagram so you have the services and data then you can bring the integration after that so you will have unmanaged API but you can build digital products using that as the first stage then uh, as a next step you can bring the security because it's really important then you can have a secure API and um, some unmanaged APIs from the previous version uh, building uh, these digital products the as a third iteration you can bring the API layer now you will have proper managed APIs exposing your business capabilities to the applications uh, then you can uh, add more stuff like you can bring IOT and then uh, you can have uh, uh, the uh, analytics uh, as a uh, capability in this uh, uh, iterative architecture approach then the second model is uh, different and then I personally prefer this uh, if you can practice basically have all the layers and this architecture layers like you have all the layers with the minimum requirement for the first project at the first stage and then uh, improve each and every layer while you are onboarding different projects and you will have the uh, the full capability at some point so let's go back to the uh, uh, the other diagram again so this is the uh, the minimum requirements required from the uh, the uh, technical capabilities for the first project you have the uh, first project on board and then implemented then you bring the second projects and increase the technical capabilities and move uh, forward and get uh, whatever the necessary uh, features that you require to deliver all your digital products so that is the second model and uh, this is uh, this provide more value than the first uh, model but then again it's totally depend on what you can do and how your environment works and what your timelines so and so forth so uh, you can decide uh, one of these models based on uh, where you are 
then the uh, uh, we talk about a platform uh, in my previous talk uh, that you build a digital platform. So the platform even can have an iterative approach that you build a project first, the, your first project and from the first project you derive your uh, platform by identifying what are the common capabilities and then plug the first project. Then the, uh, the project uh, uh, will go in this iterative cycle and second project you can onboard, third project and like that you can uh, create um, uh, room for other projects and uh, onboard them with the timeline. So if we summarize the, uh, the iterative approach, basically you plan, build, release the stuff and then deliver it, get the feedback, go to the next iteration like that you continue with uh, the, uh, uh, the timeline. So what are the tools available? Uh, the first tool and uh, this is my favorite tool, Scrum basically, use uh, the stuff, uh, different type of uh, technology, different type of standards coming uh, inside Scrum. Even Scrum has a nice um, uh, iterative architecture way that they call it as it's architecture spike and then uh, user stories and uh, quick delivery times. Uh, you will have a Scrum master and then um, like uh, stand up meetings so and so forth. It's a very simple, uh, less documented but very uh, effective methodology to use. But um, as an architect, uh, if the organization uh, required kind of a, a, a heavy architecture principles or kind of well documented architecture principles, there are two other tools. First thing called SAFE, a scale agile framework. Um, this is a little bit heavier than the uh, uh, normal Scrum uh, standards, but it provides a proper architecture framework for you to have um, these uh, agile principles and then uh, have an architecture that you can iteratively improve. Then the next thing is uh, uh, called TOGAF that's done by the Open Group of Architecture Forum. So they have a nice architecture uh, practice and it supports the iterative approach as well. If you go to their website, all the documentation are free that you can download and uh, take a look. So those are the standard tools that you can take from the, uh, the, the industry and the, the standards. But uh, our advice is like you should create your own tools as well because um, uh, the standard stuff will provide some set of uh, capabilities but you have to build your own things. So I'll explain two examples. First example is uh, Motorola, they are building, they have built a, a digital platform. If you go to this uh, Moto X phone that you can customize and buy the phone. Uh, the backend uh, interaction or the integration done using our uh, WSO2 products. Uh, basically, every click that you do uh, to create the uh, phone will call an API to different vendors and uh, start building this phone. So they have a zero touch automation framework that they created. Basically, when a development team come with an idea to uh, uh, start a project, it's basically generate the environments, like if they ask, okay, I need three environments, uh, it will automatically create the environments based on the configurations that they requested. So they call it zero touch because um, it basically um, create this environment. They use Puppet as far as I can remember as a uh, DevOps script and uh, create this thing. The second example is uh, Bank of New York Mellon. So they are they have a product called Nexon and it's a digital uh, product and uh, they are using our products to uh, build these things. So they uh, identify there's a gap uh, in between their current uh, uh, developers and then where they want to be because most of the services were written using SOAP and they want to be uh, fully restful. Uh, so they create a tool to increase the developer productivity. So what um, uh, this tool is doing, so when you point to a visitor and then you define your API using Swagger, it generates the necessary mediation by looking at the, uh, the visitor and the uh, Swagger definition that they did. So most of the stuff works, like if there are complex things, uh, you can't have a converter, but for them, uh, they, they are developer productivity increase because they don't need to write this mediation logic and convert SOAP into REST. So that's one example that they have. And they have built uh, some other tools as well because they have a subset of uh, REST principles that everybody follows. So when you create an API, there's a validator, a REST validator that uh, validate the API that they define. So uh, across the organization, they follow the same uh, set of standards. So uh, those are a few examples that how you can 
uh, generate your own tools uh, to be more agile and iterative. Then the next uh, set of tools is like uh, the um, analytics that you can show how many services running and the project status so and so forth. So you can build a lot of awareness. The, and then uh, the, uh, the concept of a store. You can have an API store, you can have an app store. Uh, that way people have access to the things that you are doing as well as it will be more transparent across the organization and they can, you can share your capabilities across different business units as well. Then the additional stuff uh, to uh, be more agile, uh, so first thing is APIs because APIs are um, the connectors that connect uh, all these uh, different um, uh, capabilities. So API everywhere is a, a good practice that you should have. And then the open interoperability, it's basically um, how you can interact with different type of technologies. Now if you take uh, WSO2 technologies, like we can connect with different type of identity management systems, we can connect with different type of um, analytical systems. Uh, so this open interoperability is there, so that way you don't need to change everything, you can connect to the existing uh, technologies and then be productive from day one. And the decentralized approach because centralized approach doesn't work uh, when it comes to full agile. As an example, uh, now if you have API management system, uh, in most cases there's a central API management team publishing the APIs, but it doesn't work uh, in a proper um, agile uh, uh, environment that you should be able to publish APIs uh, from different uh, locations and different groups, but have proper governance to uh, check whether they are doing it correctly. So decentralized is uh, uh, another thing that will help. Then the last one is uh, the edge technologies like uh, get the maximum usage of containers like especially when it comes to um, iterative and agile environments if you can build the environments quickly and if you can like wipe up this environment quickly it's really helpful so containers helping um, a lot and then the microservices architecture again helping for uh, different pods or business units to operate individually and then um, have this um, uh, like uh, single scope type of concepts uh, implemented there. Then the serverless like you can use uh, cloud uh, technologies to be uh, productive and then go to market quickly and then continuous integration, continuous testing is part of this process because without continuous integration and continuous testing you can't have this rapid uh, uh, delivery and then um, uh, iterative uh, approach uh, implemented. Then the uh, uh, then the next thing is open source providing additional uh, uh, room or freedom for you to uh, be agile and iterative because uh, you don't need to purchase uh, the product you can like quickly build a prototype by downloading this and then you get a lot of freedom because you can see the code and then uh, look what's really happening internally rather than working on a black box. And then the ownership wise since you download the code you have some ownership and then you can provide uh, contribution back to that, provide feedback so you have that ownership. And then the, there's a community behind that, that way you can be at the edge technology because different people uh, contribute that and then investment wise there's an advantage as well. Then the planning your iterations, you have to be very careful because that's why I took this um, as uh, the um, code basically. So like uh, you need to plan it properly, like it's not just divided into three months or one month or whatever the timeline or set of requirements. You should understand what is this MVP, uh, what will it provide for your consumer, whether that is the uh, uh, the most needed requirement. So by looking at that you need to uh, plan uh, these uh, different it, uh, iterations properly and uh, have the priority uh, done and decide what you are delivering in each and every iteration um, in your uh, project plan. So we talk about Nokia uh, in the beginning, so this is the last thing uh, this uh, guy, CEO said like we, did, uh, we didn't do anything wrong but something uh, uh, somehow we lost. So why it happened? Uh, so basically what happens even if you are iteratively improving at some point you will come to the peak but at the peak if you don't do this uh, uh, the jump, uh, we call it as jump to the next curve, if you don't do that at the um, correct time then somebody else will 
come and take that market. So that's where that you need to have a uh, innovation and to be innovate and then to have a massive change and deliver these things you have to have this agile and iterative approaches. So that's uh, uh, one thing that we learn what's really happening in the market like Kodak is a, another example and uh, Nokia is a good example and on the other hand that we have success stories like not uh, the Uber, uh, Airbnb like latest uh, uh, companies like people like Nike, they are like really successful because they are doing the next curve, they jump to the next curve and use the technology and give a, giving a, a proper digital experience for the, uh, 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 their consumers. So the, uh, the final, uh, the, the summary wise what uh, we had to tell, you had to be iterative and then you had to be innovative and agile and then use the uh, proper technology to uh, deliver these projects. So internally we practice all this stuff, our product development uh, happen in iterative manner and then uh, we are kind of innovative and then trying to give latest technology uh, for you guys as well and follow all these principles basically uh, lead by example. Uh, so yeah, so that's the message and uh, uh, if you have any questions, I can take those questions. Questions? Um, are there any questions? Uh, Yeah, so the, uh, I think uh, legacy company, uh, so the basically first thing is you have to find where you can start, identify a project uh, and then as I explained earlier, identify a small team. When you identify a small team, um, correctly pick the people who can quickly change and then looking for like who has some kind of a background to um, uh, learn the new technology and then deliver. So the uh, identify a small team and then uh, build a product, uh, build a pr uh, work on a project and deliver it and then show it to the uh, business side. And uh, so that might be a good approach to kind of change the uh, internal stuff because the, again, the challenge is not the technology side, you can build something, but the cultural change is the hardest part. But showing the results, so most of the digital transformation projects that we are doing are like uh, got these legacy systems and then traditional uh, uh, development uh, practices. Uh, so what basically we did uh, uh, define this small team and then start uh, delivering and then uh, follow the some of the principles that I explained like internally evangelize, doing hackathons and then show the organization there's a impact that you can and then people kind of start looking at what uh, this group is doing and you can uh, so it's basically an iterative approach to make a digital uh, workforce and a digital product basically. So it, it's basically you need to look at like uh, what are the opportunities that you have, take one opportunity and start from there. You need to take a risk, that's uh, the idea. Any other questions? Mm -hmm.